With all the excitement from Adepticon 2018, there has finally been the grand reveal of the upcoming Sisters of Battle. And with that, it, it leaves a lot of questions, you know. How has the history of the Adeptus Roitas uh, evolved after all these editions? Uh, where are they in the grand scheme of things in the 8th edition? And kind of overly, what and who are the Sisters of Battle? Today, we're going to hit that hard, going into the history of the Sisterhood, as well as their overall kind of structure. We'll even talk about what the uh, <clears throat> the differences between the Sisters of Battle and the Adepta Sororitas are. Uh, even though we use the name interchangeably, the Sisters of Battle are the Order's militant of the Adepta, uh, the Adepta Sororitas. And we'll have another video after this and go into the individual orders and a brief touch on their hit, um, the, the individual order's history, so hang tight. But uh, I want to dig in right here on the actual meat and potatoes of the Sisters of Battle themselves. But for those of you that don't know who the Sisters of Battle are, let's get a real quick summary of them as a whole. So the Imperium is segmented by various offices, arms, branches, organizations. It's really hard to say what they are. You just think of it, whatever, whatever the hell they are. But the Adeptus Astartes is one of them. Uh, and we know these to be our beloved space marines. Well, the Adeptus Ministorum, or is the arm, quote unquote, uh, of the spiritual kind of powerhouse of the Imperium. Uh, the Ecclesiarchy, as it's sometimes known, is uh, responsible for spreading the faith of the Emperor and reinforcing the Imperial Creed, which are the principles of the Imperial cult, the official uh, religion, state religion of the Imperium. And essentially think of the Roman, kind of Roman Catholic Church as it's loosely based off of that. Now, the Sisters of Battle are the army or the military of the Ecclesiarchy. They are not female space marines, um, as, as really it's commonly misconstrued. Uh, these aren't like eight foot tall, muscle bound Russian Olympic weightlifting uh, like females dragging their knuckles across the Imperium as they clasp forearms and wink suggestively at one another's bolter. But uh, now, that, now that we've got that taken care of, let's get into the, the history of all this. and, and for that, we need to jump way back to the age of apostasy. This is around uh, M36, millennium 30, 36, which is five or six millennia prior to our current timeline, which is the time of ending. And to give you a frame of reference, the age of Imperium begins in millennium 30, with the Horus Heresy in millennium 31. Uh, the Adeptus Sororitas dates back to a time when the, Ecclesiar when the Ecclesiarchy held dominion on far more than just the imperial cult. It had to exercise its clout to such an extreme that it eventually grew to control the Council of the High Lords of Terra themselves. So you can imagine how sweeping their rule was. And this would, of course, really build a lot of animosity from the other organizations that make up the Imperium. The Adeptus Administratum was even weakened to the point that the Ecclesiarchy, a spiritual organization, was making policy for the, secu for the secular arm of the Administratum. And eventually, everything was under the uh, eye of the Adeptus Ministorum. You know, army deployments, tithing, which tithing is originally what they're kind of responsible for. You know, the, the spiritual well-being, the tithing, and making sure that people are, are, are contributing to the overall um, image of the God Emperor. But in addition to tithing, obviously, uh, army deployments, raising funds for the Imperium as a whole, which is primarily an administratum, administratum thing, appointment of governors and lords, again, administratum, kind of other means of running the Imperium as a whole. Just as all previous rough times in the Warhammer 40,000 universe, uh, a bunch of warp storms just started ripping through the galaxy, you know, like a like a fat person at a Walmart with a little sale on bunt cakes or something like that. And this inevitably cuts off huge swaths of the Imperium, resulting in massive civil wars breaking out from system to system as the local governors start revolting, essentially, against the Emperor's rule. And on top of that, you have chaos invading out of the Eye of Terror, orcs running wild everywhere, a Dark Eldar taking sex slaves left and right. Overall, the galaxy has turned into a classic shit show. And as you would expect, Tons of doomsayers, you know, were, were coming out of the woodwork saying that, you know, the God Emperor has brought this about, has brought about the end times, and you know, just just all the normal apocalyptic sayings. We have to do this, we have to do that to to repent. You know, the Rapture, you know, Warhammer Forty Thousand Edition. And the entire time, you have the uh, Frateris Templars trying to suppress as much civil strife as possible by the Astra Militarum, Adeptus Astartes and Adeptus Mechanicus are busy with, you know, invaders abroad. They're not concerned with the internal infrastructure of the Imperium. And the Frateris 
Templars are essentially the pre-Scissors of Battle. Uh, this is the military of the Ecclesiarchy during the Age of Apostasy. And they're really more in line with like fucking like hired thugs than anything else. Uh, they're overly zealous, they're, they're brutal, and these guys were like beating people for fun and sport at, at one point. You know, it wasn't about the Emperor, it was just like, oh, this guy some, looks like a son of a bitch, I'm gonna punch him. And out of all this madness, enters one of the craziest bastards to be seen on the stage of the grand 40k drama, Gog Van Dyer, the, the 361st High Lord of the Administratum. Uh, Van Dyer was this insane head of state that had a huge grudge against the Ecclesiarchy due to the, the kind of aforementioned loss of power of the Grander Administratum. The Administratum was supposed to have a lot more say and a lot more uh, goings on with the overall infrastructure of the Imperium and, and this kind of like, you know, taking out of the knees, hemorrhaging of the uh, Administratum pissed off uh, Gog here. Uh, as a result, Van Dyer, for the, for the first time in history, appointed himself both the head of the Ecclesiarchy, um, also known as just the Ecclesiarch, um, which is the head of the Ministrorum, and High Lord of the Administratum. And this starts one of the worst civil wars that the Imperium has seen since the Horus Heresy. And one of the main reasons behind the Age having such an ominous moniker, this kind of begins the Reign of Blood. And in the earliest years of his rule, word had spread of a sisterhood of warriors on the distant world of San Lior. This spurred Van Dyer into action. You know, thirsty as always, he made for the world. And Van Dyer used this as a chance to really kind of amp up the propaganda being spread by the Ecclesiarchy and his uh, interaction broadcasted across the entire pyramid as he approached approach the uh, convent of the Daughters of the Emperor. He wanted people to see this happen and say, hey, look, look what I'm doing. I'm breathing. I'm bringing this brand new covenant um, into the fold for the for the greater of the greater good of the Imperium, for the Emperor, you know, so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> he arrived with a, a, a small personal army, as anyone of this sort does, a huge entourage, and his way was uh, essentially blocked. And he was told that the Daughters of the Emperor would only answer to the Emperor himself. And the every cra ever crafty bastard that this uh, Bandar was kind of gave him an idea. Uh, he was granted access to the coven by promising to show that he was, in fact, protected by the holy light of the emperor. And when inside, he instructed one of his bodyguards to just, just, just double tap him with the last pistol. Just two in the chest, one in the head. And uh, as that guardsman kind of takes aim for Bandar's heart, the guardsman you know, shot true. And right at the last minute, or second, a uh, shield that was generated by Van Dyer's Rosarius deflected the shot. And Rosarius is, for the most part, a type of technology that is both rare and relatively unknown, uh, including the, the Imperial Guardsmen. A lot of the Imperial Guardsmen don't understand a lot of the bigger and, and more fancier tech that, or more fancy tech that, say, like the Adeptus Astartes used and such like that, to the point that they, they, re they regard it, uh, they almost venerate venerated they look at it as like oh man this is this is the act of the of, of the god emperor and this is the exact result this is what van Dyer wanted and since this is so rare um it was kind of taken as a sign that van Dyer was was firm drinking pals with the emperor and uh, alicia dominica the leader of the coven uh, as well as the rest of the daughters of the emperor immediately pledged their loyalty to van dyer as the emperor's kind of mouthpiece essentially as what they as assumed he was or, or saw him as a speaking with the emperor's word now this is bad news because now you have these turbocharged well-trained badass warrior women in charge of the strongest man in the imperium um or in charge or in the charge of and as a result, the Daughters of the Emperor were renamed to the Brides of the Emperor, and they were then outfitted to the Nines like an episode of Pimp My Ride. Yo, since you love the Emperor so much, we put a brand new bolter in the backseat of your rhino. And e each sister was uh, given even more training and access to power armor and the army that the, that the Space Marines have, you know, rhinos and all that action. And they were essentially kind of treated almost like the like Van Dyer's personal Praetorians, they followed him around, they were his personal uh, bodyguard, and they also were his personal executioners, exacting his will as as to the uh, daughters of the Emperor, or brides of the Emperor, as an extension of the Emperor's will. And I feel this is really a good time, if any, to bring this up, but it's important to note that these are not space marines, as I mentioned earlier. The Sisters of Battle are simply women, 
They are not genetically enhanced outside of their training and religious zeal pure, slash purity of purpose. That doesn't cheat them. Not in any way. Uh, the, the Sisters of Battle accomplish a lot of really amazing feats, and a lot of it has to do with their zeal, with their purity of purpose, with that, uh, that faith. And the Emperor, way, way back, uh, back in the days of Yol, tried to make female space marines, but the experiment ultimately ended in you know, fail failures, multiple times, multiple times. And the reason being that the Marines, well, the reason being that, that the Marines are copies of Primarchs, which are in turn made in the Emperor's likeness, in his likeness. So the genetic base being male results in organ failure across the board for every female space marine, which led to the Emperor just eventually ba abandoning the project. Now that we've established that, let's get back to this, because shit is about to get a spicy. Obviously, Van Dyer's Reign of Blood is not well-received among the Imperium populace. And you don't hear about gangs in the Underhives proclaiming, man, you know, this oppression, high tithe, taxation, overall tyranny is just right on point. Exactly what I needed. And a lot of you might be wondering, where the hell are the High Lords? You know, the Custodes, the Astartes, the Mechanicum. Well, for the most part, everyone acts relatively autonomously and without the consent or really the care of the other parties, especially the Astartes, uh, which is, you know, kind of a given. But as a result, they don't really care much about each other. So if the Administratum or Administratum and Ecclesiarchy are running wild, that doesn't really affect the war efforts on the front line or the personal defense of the Emperor, you know, for the Custodes. Um, there was one man that was just not having it, though. Sebastian Thor. This badass, who I can imagine looks, you know, kind of similar to One Punch Man with just a double helping of chrome dome and chiseled jaw, started a new sect of the Imperial cult, the Confederation of Light. Built on the promise that there would be an end to the darkness brought about by Van Dyer, the Confederation of Light, uh, of Life, or I'm sorry, of light, uh, denounced Van Dyer as a traitor and uh, kind of began to, you know, it, the, the, the overall confederation started to big, pick up steam very fast among the populace, especially in the Segmentum Obscura, uh, their home system. Uh, to give you kind of a frame of reference, the Segmentum Obscura is where the Space Wolves, uh, Cadia, the Eye of Terror, Caliban, and Ulthwe all reside. You know? So it's a, a pretty important portion of the, uh, of the Imperium. The Confederation of Light, though, started to take over more and more planets, causing an empire-wide reformation. And Van Dyer grew a uh, kind of wild hair across his ass and sent out his Bateris Templar to put Thor down, looking to stem this revolution before it got out of hand. The guy's name's Thor, though. Like, you're going to send some dudes and, like, put him in line? Come on. Come on, buddy. So a combined naval and ground force was sent out to destroy the Confederation on their home world of Dimimar. It's way up in the upper right portion of the segment of Obscura. Uh, but en route, a massive warp storm slammed into the fleet and destroyed it to a man. And this was believed to have been the, the Emperor himself interceding with the, the storm thusly named Storm of the Emperor's Wrath. So this victory, if it could be called that, spurred the Confederation on, now believing that the Emperor was guiding them to this fate, you know, overthrowing Van Dyer. Um, it was around this time that the other branches of the Imperium began to take note of the resources that Van Dyer was expending, trying to uh, put down Thor, as well as Van Dyer's own tyrannical rule. So the Adeptus Mechanicus and Astartus both began to mobilize against the Ecclesiarch, uh, joining up with Thor and making way for Terra and the Imperial Palace, or well, I guess the Ecclesiarchal Palace. And the Fabricator General, that's the head of the Adeptus uh, Mechanicum, got the High Lords of Terra to basically censure and oust uh, Van Dyer, you know, saying like, hey, you know, no, no more of your shenanigans, Gog. To which Van Dyer responded by dissolving the Senatorum Imperialis, or that's again, the High Lords of Terra. Everything, <clears throat> for the most part, guys, it's important to know, everything has like a super gaudy Warhammer 40,000 Latin name, and then just a pretty simple, kind of cool sounding normal name, like High Lords of Terra, or the Senatorum Imperialis or the Space Marines, or the Adeptus Astartes. So it's always got this shit attached to it. But he he basically dissolves the Hylos of Terra and declares the Mechanicus and the Astartes traitors. 
I mean, fucking big mistake, bro. Because there's not a single fighting force in the galaxy that needs even more reason to fight for the Emperor than the Space Marines. And if you've just given them a reason to fight even harder to prove that they're innocent and that they're actually working for the Emperor's might and wrath, they're just going to go balls out crazy on you. Uh, previously, the Astartes had considered themselves kind of neutral to the reign of blood as they uh, focused on defending the Imperium's borders. But now they dedicated four whole chapters to taking Van Dyer out. So, <clears throat> to give you an idea, the Black Templars, you know, who, when they hear the word crusade, just start revving their chain swords, headbutting each other and shouting, the, and shouting wildly. The Imperial Fists, you know, the Sentinels of Terra, the Firehawks. Um, the Firehawks are pretty rad because they're the eventual, or what eventually becomes the Legion of the Damned. And lastly, the Soul Drinkers. Uh, these guys are a future renegade chapter and they're an offshoot chapter of the Imperial Fists, but still, they're kind of overall Sentinel Terra type feel and underlying uh, uh, dedication to the Emperor is <laughs> not wanting. But uh, Van Dyer's outrage was vast and wrathful. The Confederation of Light and its allies dealt with resistance all the way to Terra itself. The Firehawks even lost their planet to uh, this full thermonuclear attack by Van Dyer. And the Adeptus Astartes, uh, expecting Terra's Templars at the Ecclesiarchal Palace on Terra made planet fall in one of their famous drop pod assaults. Um, if you've ever played Dawn of War, the very like over the top intro for the, the Space Ring campaign, they in in the Codex of Stardust, it's actually called uh, Steel Rain. But uh, that's just give you an idea. Like it's a very common thing is for the, the Space Marines to use a, a lightning strike, fast attack, uh, drop pod attack. So the sky was really a light across Terra with the, the burning streaks of the fiery descent of angels as they sought to exact the Emperor's justice against Van Dyer, ending his reign of blood. The Adeptus Astartes were met with firm and zealous resistance as instead of the easily swept aside Frateris Templar, they faced the full might of the Brides of the Emperor. You know, the power armor clad and bolter wielding sisters of battle fought with fanatic zeal, fearless in the face of the Emperor's angels of death. And this is something that kind of um, gave pause to the Space Marines. They're not used to fighting another Imperial force that is equally as ferocious as them or as zealous as them in battle. What was supposed to have been a kind of a lightning strike like we were talking about turned into a multi-month slog and, and a siege of the palace of the Ecclesiarch or the Ecclesiarchal Palace. As the Space Marines attacked, the Adeptus Custodes was finally cued in on the goings-on of the Reign of Blood and went to make their move. Um, they, they had been in silent communication with the four chapters in orbit, with the chapter masters, finding out more and more about the depth of the apostasy of Van Dyer. So one small squad, led by the centurion of the, of the companions, uh, that's the leader of the custodians, confronted Alicia Dominica in the Ecclesiarchal Palace. Now, a heated argument kind of broke out, where the centurion was saying, hey, just drop your vows. This is not who, to who you think it is. You're not doing the Emperor's will. And Alicia Dominica said, nay, nay, I am but doing the Emperor's will. And burn and fire heretic. But <clears throat> they're basically just trying to decide who was on the right side of the Emperor. And finally, the centurion told Alicia Dominica and her personal bodyguard, uh, Arabella, Catherine, Lucia, and Silvana, these these names are all important to the future lore and current lore of the Sisters of Battle, so that's why I bring them up. But he, he takes her and her five bodyguards with him back to the Golden Throne, leaving his men behind as hostages. Hostages, that's not sausages. Uh, and this is where things get hazy because it's purposely supposed to be super vague as to what exactly transpires between the Emperor and the Brides of the Emperor. But after that meeting, Alicia is just pissed. And again, that, that vagueness is intentional because there's not many, there's, in fact, there's very few points in the lore, aside from books like the uh, Master of Mankind or the First Heretic, where the Emperor has a literal voice. He has a figurative voice, or he has a voice that say, the Emperor's will is thus, but the Emperor never speaks to another individual in any books outside of a handful of Horus Heresy books. In which case, it's a flashback, or it's like a it's it and of, it and of it in of itself is a distant memory and not a, not a current like this is happening in the now. So that's important to know. That's why it's so vague and why it is like oh, it was never recorded what happened in that room that night. 
it's intended to be that way. But so she and her bodyguard are just fucking mad. They storm back into the Ecclesiarchal Palace and confront Van Dyer. And she says, in this, this kind of badass quote from the second edition Sisters of Battle book that I'm, that I'm going to repeat right here for you guys. Uh, you have committed the ultimate heresy. Not only have you turned your back on the Emperor and stepped from his light, you have profaned his name and almost destroyed everything he has striven to build. You have perverted and twisted the path he has laid for mankind to tread. As you own decrees have stated, there can be no mercy for such a crime, no pity for such a criminal. I renounce your lordship. You walk in the darkness and cannot be allowed to live. Your sentence has been long overdue, and now it is time for you to die. After that, Van Dyer gets sassy and says he doesn't have time to die, to which uh, Dominica cuts his head clean off with her power sword, thus ending the age of apostasy and the reign of blood of Go Goji Gog Van, D Van Dyer. With this, and begin with this kind of end of everything, begins what's called the Thorian Reformation as uh, Sebastian Thor was declared the uh, 292nd Ecclesiarch. Thor then went about a, a total overhaul of the, uh, minist of the Ministorum and the way it interacted with the Imperium as a whole. For one, he instilled the decree passive, which disbanded the Frateris Templar under the pretense that it forbade the Adeptus Ministorum from controlling any men under arms. This leaves our brides and their fate. They adopted their original name, the Daughters of the Emperor, and remained as the military arm of the Ecclesiarchy. You know, this is kind of purposely falling under a loophole as the Adeptus Sororitas are not men. Uh, this created the Orders Militant of the Adeptus Sororitas, or, or what we know as the Sisters of Battle. And their ranks swelled to even more warrior women as they were trained to the height of normal unaltered humans, their faith and underlying strength that kind of allowed them to excel beyond their unaltered peers. Alicia Dominica uh, creating, created the, uh, the Order's Militant, um, or creating the Order's Militant, became the founder and eventual patron saint of the Adeptus Sororitas. And they are then, the, the, the Order itself, the overall arcing Adeptus Sororitas, are then divided into two major convents. The Convent Prioris, Prioris on Terra, and Convent Sanctorum on Ophelia 4, or uh, 7, 7. <laughs> I look at VII and I'm like, oh my god, what the hell number is that again? On uh, Ophelia 7. The oldest cardinal world, or what is now actually called Shrine Worlds, they were they were renamed, I think it was like a, the 39th millennium or some shit. But and the cardinal worlds are essentially worlds that are run exclusively by the Ecclesiarchy. Uh, Dominica and her five companions, they become the first canonists, canonists, canonesses, uh, sorry, the word is a doozy, of each of the orders you see in this video. So with Dominica leading the Order of the Even Chalice. Now, around this time, the Ordo Hereticus was formed as well, with the sisters becoming the chamber militant of the new and third arm of the Inquisition. And as we've talked about before, each Ordo has its own military branch. Ordo Zenus has the Death Watch, Ordo Malleus has the Grey Knights, and Ordo Hereticus has the Sisters of Battle. And the Ordo Hereticus is essentially, the overall task is to root out any kind of, it's, it's easy to say the word heresy, but apostasy. It is, it is to find any kind of corruption, not on just a spiritual level, but on a genetic level, on a mental level of, of people that are sick of mind. Like people that are trying to overthrow the government for their own personal gain, not because they're influenced by chaos. And that was the important thing here in the age of apostasy, is that that's what the kind of the theme was. So the hereticus is basically designed to root out the heretic and burn the witch alive. So the convocation of Nephilim, this is the uh, kind of like a, a grand treaty, was signed by the sisters and the Ordo. Kind of they bound the two organizations together, kind of interwove their fate. And this ability also ensures that neither would ever kind of rise to a position of supremacy, since both are kind of, they're dealing with the health of the infrastructure of the Imperium. So this way it kind of ensures that none of them, neither of them can really supersede and take control. Um, this kind of ensures that there's no kind of overall threat to the Imperium like there was um, with Van Dyer. 
Realizing now kind of how long this video is, I, I, I want to save all the juicy bits about each and every order and what they do um, for that other video, but we need to discuss the overall organization of the Adeptus Aroitas. Um, so, it, so it all disseminates down from the Ecclesiarchy at the top of the chain. The Greater Adeptus Soroitas then splits into the two covens that we've talked about. Um, the Abbess Sanctorum, that's the basically the, the leader of the Covenant Prioris, is also the leader of the entire Adepta. Um, that would mean that uh, Dominica would be the very first Abbess. Uh, you then have your Orders, uh, obviously the Orders Militant, the Sisters of Battle as we know them to be. And you see that there are six main orders here. And this is based off of Dominica and her five companions. We talked about this earlier. These, these five would be important. Well, boom, here it is. They each have their own order. And you have uh, the larger part. I mean, these, this is a small portion of the Adepta Sororitas. The larger part of it is really the non-militant orders. And that's your orders, hospitaliers. These are your nurses, your doctors and field surgeons, you know, traveling from system to system, world to world, giving aid to plague-stricken hives, uh, war-torn systems, or essentially just helping to educate a populace on medicine. Uh, you've got your orders familios. Uh, these, are, these act primarily as the advisors and teachers and mentors to the various noble houses and governing houses of the many systems and worlds of the Imperium. Now, we talked a little bit about this here, but um, this essentially kind of ensures that that no part of the uh, of these ruling houses becomes corrupt because if, if it corrupts from the head down that's a bad thing so you have these uh, these essentially the what is essentially a branch of the Inquisition placed in all of these governing houses these noble houses to ensure no shit goes awry more or less so even though they're there as as uh, from an educational standpoint or, or from an advisory standpoint they're also keeping an eye on, on them in one way or another. And that's kind of like the scary thing about the underlying portion of the Inquisition of the Imperium. They're always just kind of there and it's, they're, they're terrifying. We'll go into them more in depth if you guys want a, a little separate video on the Inquisition because they're huge, but they're, they're definitely trying to ensure that never again is there another Horus heresy or Age of Apostasy. Then you've got your Orders Dialogos and they're the uh, scribes and translators of the Adeptus Sororitas. Uh, they kind of spend their time locked locked away to uh, translate old history out of low gothic or educating the masses on the rich history of the imperium but this sums up roughly the organization to which the chamber militant works under uh, you can see that they've evolved from this highly militaristic machine with fanatical zeal to a dual role you know one befitting their previous namesake you know fanatic is all fuck but the other to the altruistic kind of approach of spreading the Emperor's word through more than just righteous hellfire and bolters. And it's interesting to see them kind of come from their initial humble ro uh, roots uh, to evolve into this other, uh, essentially the bad guy, right? The defender of the bad guy who, who's been kind of misplaced, the, uh, the, the, the anti-hero almost, who's now placed back into the position of, of the original intent of being for the Emperor. So it's a very interesting, they have a very, they have a cool arc, I'll say that. Um, and I'm very excited to see what the Game Workshop releases for the Sisters of Battle. Uh, just seeing some of the newer range of plastic models has me all kind of tingly to see how they will do the, the Sisters of Battle justice this time around. And the Adeptus Sororitas have always been this hugely unique portion of the Warhammer 40k universe, like I was just saying. Uh, but they've always kind of been shot to the back burner, kind of been shortchanged a little bit. And on top of that, uh, they, they have a really good... Uh, to repeat myself, uh, a really good story arc. The, the, the Space Marines kind of have one that plummets downward, I feel. Like, we are the Legion on the Great Crusade, brother, brother! To, we're chapters, brother, brother! Like, it, it doesn't really have a, a, an arc to it. Like, yeah, sure, there's this grand fall, but in the, in the end, they're kind of like the same that they were in the, in, during the Great Crusade, just like not in a Legion anymore. Whereas the Adeptus Roitas, Adeptus Roitas has kind of evolved to being more than just a military branch or military arm of the Imperium. And I really, I kind of really dig the story of the Adeptus Roitas a little bit more than the Adeptus uh, Legionis, even though, fucking, come on guys, it's Space Marines, of course they have a huge boner for them. But they have this uh, sort of retro sci-fi look to them, you know, this, this look of uh, women with uh, short white hair, uh, it's very like uh, Aeon Flux, reminds me a lot of that, so lots of hard lines, like, uh, like very chiseled jaws and shit like that. 
but each character is really a badass because none of them are space marines and are still capable of exacting these incredible feats through the face of the Emperor. Uh, I mean, Dominica, she ends up dying uh, 600 some years later after the, the convocation of Nephilim on, um, I can't remember the name of the planet, but like she's like stabbed and shot like hundreds of times and is finally like put, like just shot point blank in her heart by Alaska and like, but after just suffering tons and tons of wounds, like well above what a normal human should be allowed to take. So they have these really amazing feats that was really all done through their faith. And I think we're going to get a really stunning codex with the eventual release of the Adeptus Roitas later in 2019. But thanks so much for watching here today, guys. Hopefully this helps shed some light on one of uh, Warhammer 40,000's biggest black sheeps. And I'd like to do another video discussing the individual ranks and the orders of the Sisters of Battle. So if you're down for that, let me know in the comments. Or if there's any more lore you'd like me to dig into, please let me know below. Or if there's more you know about the Sisters of Battle, definitely let me know. I wasn't able to get into them as much as a kid, I was still like, girls are icky, I want my space bros. So, if you played them, you're a diehard Sisters of Battle fan, and there's more stuff you want to talk about, let me know in the comments. If you if you post a big enough comment that's like full, chock full of information, I always pin it, I always make sure it's at the top of the, the, the videos, because I want to make sure there's as much information for people to gather in these videos as possible. But uh, don't forget to like the video and subscribe, and thanks again guys, take care.